wondering if you could do two favors. Well, what are they? Uh, taking me to the nearest police station. A daring escape and police rescue ended a chapter of horrors for Ruby Frankie's youngest two children. You come in, my buddy. I am a police officer. But there's still a long road of recovery ahead. They certainly have every opportunity to rise above all of this hardship, but it's going to take a lot of work and it's not going to be something that's very easy for these kids to do. It's a story that made national headlines when Ruby Frankie's youngest son escaped a makeshift prison and ran for help. But according to experts like forensic psychologist Dr. John Delatory, that was just the beginning. It's certainly possible that they really struggle. It's also possible that they're able to, to move on in a relatively quick amount of time and, and have a happy, healthy life, and never thinking about this ever again. Prior to her arrest, Ruby Frankie amassed more than 2 million followers on her YouTube channel, Eight Passengers, that followed the life of her family, including her husband, Kevin, and their six children. I don't want our relationship to be an untrusting relationship. And I love you with all my heart. The videos focused on Ruby's parenting techniques, which many viewers found controversial. And my kids are literally starving. I hesitate to say this because it's going to sound like I'm like a mean barbarian, but I told the kids, I said, I'm not even going to let you eat breakfast until you get your chores done. Throughout the videos, Ruby showed her children's faces, spoke their names, and told personal details about their lives. It has been amazingly well behaved for being in town. Why for you like... yelled at me? <laughs> Shh. The fact that I yell at my kids is a secret. We don't want our viewers to know that never happens in my house. I never yell. We originally heard Ruby Frankie's name because she did hundreds of videos about her children, about her family. So these kids had their faces and names out there for people across the world for many years. So let's put the abuse aside for one second. If we're focusing just on that, could that take a mental toll on a kid having their personal life out there for anyone to see? It's exploitive, absolutely. They, they don't view themselves as probably being children outside of the abuse, right? If we're just looking at the ways in which she is using them as props, as props for whatever it is that she, that she thinks uh, is the most appro appropriate parenting styles, um, they're, uh, all they're going to be is just these individuals that are not shown real love, but are shown a facade of love. They're shown a mask of love only to be used as a character in these stories that she's telling to online individuals who don't know the actual truth of what's going on with them. Then, in August of last year, this harrowing 911 call was made. I just had a 12-year-old boy show up here at my front door asking for help. And he's a uh, said he had just came from a neighbor's house, and we know there's been problems at this neighbor's house. He's emaciated, he's got tape around his legs, he's hungry and he's thirsty. And he asked us to call the police. What's so he's very afraid. That little boy was Ruby Frankie's youngest son, who escaped from duct tape shackles around his wrists and ankles and ran for help. Hi, I was just wondering if you could do two favors. Well, what are they? Uh, taking me to the nearest police station. Well, actually, just one's fine. What's going on, son? Have a seat there. It's personal business. Have a seat. What's your name? How'd you get here? I... First responders arrived to the scene to find Ruby's two youngest children, a boy and a girl, emaciated with open wounds. They both needed medical treatment. You don't want to talk to me? Yeah, that's okay. Can you come with me though? We got Jody out here. You know Jody? She's outside with us. You, you take your time, but I'm in no hurry. I'm a police officer. Did you know that? I don't mean to hurt you at all. You doing okay? Are you scared? 
Yeah. You're okay. Do you need help? You want to come with me? No. Not gonna hurt you. Promise. See this right here? It's a badge. It tells me I don't hurt people. I'm just here to make sure you're okay. You're in no way in any trouble. I'm not here to hurt you. I just want to make sure you're okay. And I get if you're scared. I would be too. Okay. You want to come with me? You've now seen the video. He's very small and has a lot of injuries. What is going through the children's heads when they're finally being rescued by first responders? I think if I had to, if I had to guess, I think it would probably be relief. I think there was a drive for survival that led him to escaping the hell that he had been living in. And then once someone was able to, to listen to him and see what was actually going on with him, I think there might have been a sense of relief that's that that he was no longer held captive anymore, that someone was there that was going to protect him and not put him back in that situation. And we've seen the physical tolls, as I mentioned, on his body, both children, very emaciated, had some open wounds, things like that. But also, I'm interested in the psychological side of things. I mean, they had months on end of this abuse. How would that affect them right away? I mean, it's not just the abuse, right? There's plenty of research that looks at what kind of, uh, of consequences there are for the abuse, but it's who's doing the abuse. Oftentimes it's by some enemy, right? There's a lot of research about, you know, POWs and stuff like that. But this was your own mother that was doing this. This she was doing this and she was laughing about it by creating all these different videos. There were so many different things that not only did they feel kind of objectified, but they felt belittled. They probably felt as though no one was ever going to love them ever again because of the indoctrination that she had about who they were as individuals. So the physical toll is one thing, it's the psychological toll of not only experiencing the abuse, but who your abuser was and how much you're supposed to have love for that individual, but clearly you cannot. And it's hard to say how those things are going to end up moving forward because children are often resilient, but when coupled with such physical and embarrassment type uh, of abuse, that I think these children are going to need a lot of help for a long amount of time. Ruby Frankie and Jody Hildebrandt were ultimately arrested and later charged with six counts of aggravated child abuse each. Those counts were bumped down to four when both women pleaded guilty to the crime. They're now serving time in prison. Even still, Delatore says the children will face fallout from their crimes. But for these younger two kids who endured most of the trauma here and the abuse, what sort of things could they be experiencing in the months since their rescue? Nightmares, fears that, that all of these things are going to continue, uh, even though the their you know their mother is going to be in prison for quite a long time. There's probably going to be an underlying thing where uh, the next person is going to do this, or somehow she's going to be able to escape, and they're going to be put back into uh, her custody. All of these kinds of things, because there's a lack of trust. How can they really trust any authority figure moving forward if their mother was willing to do this, to abuse them in this way? How can they really trust? So there's going to be a long and enduring fear associated with it happening again. So how does a child that young, still developing physically, mentally, how do they recover from that or even make sense of something like that? You can't, you can't truly recover. You can't, you can't truly make sense. What the best that you can do is try to identify how you as the, as the victim are going to move forward from this. The, 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 there's still plenty of time, right? They are still young. There's still plenty of time for them to kind of figure out what this all meant. What was the purpose for all of this to happen to them and not allow her ongoing tentacles of abuse to continue to impair and, and, and impede their ability to be functioning adults. They are not broken in any way. They certainly have every opportunity to rise above all of this hardship. 
but it's going to take a lot of work and it's not going to be something that's very easy for these kids to do. Delatory says a big hurdle for both children will be learning to trust other adults or people in positions of power. This is going to be one of those things where you're right. It was a parent, uh, a parenting figure, number one. But then this other person comes in who's essentially or allegedly a licensed professional who's also endorsing all of these kinds of things. So the next therapist that comes in, how do these kids know that they have their best interests? There's no way to know. Right. As the victim, there's no way to know what's going on inside someone's mind or what they have inside their heart. So there's always going to be this kind of disconnect and distance from each individual authority figure, whether it's an adult or another peer like individual, they're going to have a difficult time really kind of bonding and connecting. Now, luckily, they have each other. And that might be the instance that they need to kind of propel them forward to trusting other people if they can be together. But eventually, they're going to need to learn how to do that separately, and that's going to be a tall task. One silver lining that the youngest two Frankie children can rely on each other. There's always going to be a bond there. And I think really this probably kind of solidifies it even more that these two are probably going to be inseparable uh, moving forward. And there's nothing, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I think having someone there that can understand what you went through and at maybe at one time someone, you know, is a little bit more exaggerated or elevated that the other one knows how to bring that other person down to help calm them down. That's going to go a long way because the worst thing is to feel totally and completely alone. What about those other siblings, the oldest four who weren't physically abused or mentally abused in the same way? Could seeing their youngest siblings be abused this violently affect their psyche as well? Yeah, I think so. I think some of them might be thinking, you know, thank God it didn't happen to me. Or some of them are probably thinking, how come it happened to me and no one caught it in time? There's so many, because we don't really know what was going on within that household. And I, 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 I don't want all of these children to start, you know, relaying all of their stories, because that's not really for us. It's for them. It's for them to bond as siblings to really talk about this is what our life was like, and be there and understand each other as a stronger familial unit. And that families can look whatever way that that we want them to look. And I think my hope is that these, uh, that these children are really going to bond more because they experienced all of these things. And now it's out in the open. But that exposure and national recognition could affect the children's mental health recovery. A lot of people know these kids' names and maybe even their faces. Does that make the recovery for them even more difficult because they're known figures? It can. Yeah, I know. Absolutely. It can because the more the more people know about you, the more that they're just going to assume things about you. And so I think it's going to be important for them. I, I know they're very young now, but I, I think it's going to be important for them to not be on social media, to potentially not do interviews. I think that there's a lot of work that they need to do. I think they need to develop, you know, emotionally and, and just physically. I think there's a lot of development that needs to happen before they can go out there and really, really be in the public eye because there's too much, too much of what happened to them is already in the public eye, which is already embarrassing and demeaning in and of itself. Needless to say of what exactly it was that happened to you and who did it. Moving forward, Delatory suggests the kids head back to school to have as much time as they can with their peers. I, from my perspective, public school is always going to be the best bet, especially for children. It's one of those times when you really learn who you are by watching other people and by connecting with other people. I think homeschool might be too stunting emotionally and socially. I think there you always run a risk that you know they're going to be bullied or something like that but it's it's again one of those things where they have each other that they can lean on that it can certainly go a long way but having connections with other peers is going to be the 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 impetus for healing because children really need other children to help them grow and, and foster their identity and they don't necessarily need to talk about all that trauma right away Honestly, the last thing that I would want us to do is talk about trauma. The last thing that I would want us to do is really discuss this. If I was treating these kids, I'd be going out and playing sports with them. I'd be going out and drawing with them. I'd be going out and, you know, taking them to museums or watching movies. They need to understand that there are adults that are willing to protect them and engage in activities that they like to do. 
once you can get to a place where you all feel comfortable and you can live a life that actually has happiness in it, then you can start working on some of these other trauma consequences. But it's really about understanding that life is more than just what happened to you, that there's all different kinds of things that you probably missed growing up that we can start identifying now. But all of this doesn't mean their trauma lasts forever. It doesn't have to mean the rest of their life is ruined. And the, everybody makes mistakes. It, life is hard, right? Life is hard. That's why no one survives it. But the issue is, is that it doesn't have to define you. It doesn't have to be the thing that, you know, when people say your name, that that's the first thing that they can, that they think of. It's up to you as the individual to, to, to start thinking about how do I want to, to live my life? If, if they want to reconnect with their mother and they can, and they, 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 they've worked through everything that they happened, there's no, there's no reason for that connection to not happen. But the same, the opposite is true as well, where if they want nothing to do with the Frankie name at all, they can absolutely do that. However it is that they want to heal, then that's the best way to heal. What would that decision look like for the kids if they decided, yes, I do want to maintain a relationship with my mom, visit her in prison, have these phone calls. How would they decide that? It's going to be rough. And I think it's one of those things that they're probably going to really have to lean on their siblings and probably their father a whole lot more because there's still an element of exploitation and coercion and manipulation that is associated with Ruby and whatever it is that she's trying to do. So if I was their therapist, I would absolutely caution wanting to re-engage in that relationship now. Let's get through some trauma work. Let's get through some of these abilities to, to, to move from one emotional state to the next. Let's get through some of this work before we start identifying those times in which a, a reconnection is, is actually possible. Because it may not ever be, and that might not be on them. Some, some of it also has to do with Ruby Frankie herself. So there's a, lot, there's a lot of time that needs to elapse before a healthy connection can actually occur. Right now, the Frankie children are being cared for by the state of Utah, but their father, Kevin Frankie, has filed for custody. According to Kevin's attorney, the children have begun receiving mental health treatment since their rescue. Reporting for Long Crime, I'm Sierra Gillespie.